Hello, good morning, uh, Jo Regelt. Um, I'm very honoured to join you today, uh, especially amongst such an esteemed audience and other speakers. Um, I wasn't expecting to join you, to be honest, um, uh, but there are a lot of surprises these days. Um, but this is a good one. Uh, Jakob Borotinsky sends his sincere apologies that uh, he cannot be with you today. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about the European Commission's ambitious digital agenda with a specific focus on the areas that I'm working on, which are cybersecurity and digital privacy. Um, perhaps on a personal note to begin with, um, let me tell you that I rejoined the Commission in March, um, having spent over six years with the European Data Protection Supervisor and my former boss, Wojciech Wiewiorowski, will be speaking to you later today. Um, and I spent only two weeks in the office um, before we all went into lockdown. Um, and the following two to three months were perhaps the most surreal of, of all of our lives, but um, only if you were fortunate enough not to be afflicted by the virus itself. But what I learned was that um, the technology we're dependent on is a number of things at the same time. Uh, first of all, it's amazing. You really don't need to be in the office all the time. I mean, you, and you don't need to meet in person uh, to work effectively. Um, in fact, this is uh, perhaps my sixth day in the office since, uh, since lockdown. Um, we don't come in very often at the moment because the virus is still... Uh, is still quite um, uh, quite powerful in Belgium. Um, second, that technology is imperfect and that it's open to abuse. Uh, Zoom bombing in the early weeks of the pandemic, if you remember, was a very ugly experience. Um, thirdly, you need a break from technology. People seem to think uh, that with um, remote working, you, you can be in a meeting all day. In fact, your eyes and your brain need a break from screens um, so you can appreciate the people and nature around you. Fourth thing, th technology is political. The ownership of supply chains and the control of data have become a geopolitical football. The biggest stories in the last few months have been US restrictions on Huawei and the threat to ban TikTok. So in the commission and especially in DG Connect, our priority in the crisis has been to find ways for technology and data to work in the public interest in the biggest crisis we've had in several generations. And indeed, the area that's taken up most of my time personally since March has been developing rapidly a policy on the consistent development uh, of mobile apps to support contact tracing. Now, already across Europe, we have 42 million downloads of these apps, approved national apps. Um, 18 have been launched, three are due to launch. Hungary was one of the first to launch a contact tracing app in Europe and in the world. And we're close to making most of them interoperable, which means that you can travel around the EU with your national app um, and still be notified if you've been exposed to the virus by someone using an app from a different country. But the fact is that digitization, which was already rapid, has accelerated through necessity during this pandemic. Yes. So what we're doing in, uh, in DG Connect and in the Commission is we're trying to put up guardrails to ensure that um, technology doesn't, isn't used in ways that harm people, but at the same time that we promote its use and that we promote um, European companies who are investing in, in technology. All of this means that we need to be able to trust technology. And that's why cybersecurity is more than ever on the top of the European political agenda. COVID-19 can be classified as the largest ever cybersecurity threat. 
there have been fre frequent attacks on essential infrastructure, um, including financial services and energy, but, but also on hospitals. Um, the Brno University Hospital in Czech Republic in March was attacked. Um, Dusseldorf Hospital last month in September was subject to a ransomware attack where a man actually died as a result. So cybersecurity can no longer be considered separate from physical security. COVID-19 has heightened the level of threats um, and the alert or uh, the level of alert and information sharing in the EU technical cybersecurity cooperation work network, the CSERTS network. And it's been matched by the formation of an EU institutional task force, which includes EU CERT, the EU Cybersecurity Agency and ESA, Europol and the European Action Service, External Action Service. So even though COVID-19 is extremely disruptive, it doesn't occur in a vacuum. It's accelerated pre-existing pre trends, um, hyper-connectivity, more and more devices being connected, um, no, uh, the phenomenon known as the Internet of Things, which translates into a greater attack surface for actors who want to cause harm or disruption. They can be criminals or they could be state actors, hostile state actors. Enabling technologies like 5G, artificial intelligence, automation and robot robotics will increase our reliance on connected objects. And there, is, there are predictions that there could be 25 billion of them by 2021, next year. The deployment of these, of, the, of this technology will spark a new wave of a data revolution with the potential to transform key, transform key sectors, including health. And this means that the impact of cyber attacks can become more severe, as I've just demonstrated with the two examples from Czech Republic and Germany, and there are many more. Furthermore, there is now a geopolitical dimension to what we do on cybersecurity. Um, technologies have been the, the focus of increased tensions between nation states who are torn between their desire to develop um, in open markets and to avoid excessive dependence on technologies and data which they do not control. And this has been clearly shown by the discussions around the cybersecurity of 5G equipment and networks. Um, and we in the EU and in the Commission before, just before the lockdown, uh, adopted a toolkit for the uh, deployment of 5G networks in a safe way, um, which, is ensure, which is ensuring now a coordinated approach between member states based on objective criteria, whatever the, um, the shades of, of uh, political views which, which um, obtain in, in different countries. But in addition to that, we support the development of the open internet. Um, it's true that there has been retrenchment the splinter net is a real phenomenon. Data localization is something which is um, attractive and appealing to an increasing number of countries. And we, we in the EU have to confront foreign attackers. Sometimes they're, cl they're closely linked to states. Um, we use the, the EU's diplomatic toolbox um, in cybersecurity as well, um, and indeed, for the first time in the summer, it was activated where we applied sanctions against individuals who we considered to be responsible for cyber disruption in previous months. And faced with these growing challenges, we need to become more resilient, autonomous and engaged in the international context. Now, these themes and these challenges are going to be taken up at the end of this year in a new cybersecurity strategy. It will help us define how Europe can better develop its approach to cyberspace in the next decade. We're planning to set out a vision for how we would like European cyberspace to look in 2030, where people can be as safe online as they are offline. Resilience entails um, securing our critical infrastructure. And so at the end of this year, at the same time as the strategy, there will be a proposal from the European Commission for the reform of the 
Network and Information Systems Directive, um, which was um, which was adopted in in 2016. This will clarify and simplify and harmonise the rules which apply to those um, those entities which are responsible for um, essential services. Alongside that, we're going to be developing proposals for a joint cyber unit, which will be um, which will be a, a, a a more coherent way of responding to major incidents and crises in the in cyberspace um, so that Europe can bring all of its collective resources and expertise um, and use them in a coherent way, um, whether it's um, whether it's uh, civilian uh, resources, law enforcement, um, diplomatic and even even defence. We have to improve the way that the EU cooperates collectively and, responsi and, and, um, and responsibly to common threats. Um, in the, in the, on the question of autonomy, um, we are, we're investing um, an enormous amount, an unprecedented amount in European industry and in European solutions. Um, Cybersecurity is one of the top priorities of the, dig of the Digital Europe programme. Uh, for which um, 6.67 million billion euro have been allocated uh, are, are, um, are earmarked for um, for cybersecurity actions. Uh, the recovery fund, furthermore, will will contribute to this. President von der Leyen announced recently that 20% of the funds allocated in national recovery and resilience plans will have to be allocated to digital. Europe will continue to pursue an open and rules-based internet which is respectful of democratic values while demanding that foreign partners restrain from attacks. Now, let me talk briefly about e-privacy. E-privacy is part of cybersecurity in the same way as the GDPR is perhaps the most powerful instrument that has been adopted so far for um, encouraging responsible use of information, which is uh, which is also an element of cybersecurity, um, we have we adopted a proposal for e-privacy a few years ago. Um, it's been difficult, to be honest, getting an agreement um, in the council, but we are um, we're supporting the German presidency of the council um, in this, this this second half of 2020 to to try to get a political agreement amongst member states so that discussions, formal negotiations can begin with the European Parliament um, who adopted their position um, uh, almost three years ago now. Um, along with um, ensuring that people can be confident that their communications will be treated with respect and kept secure, um, which is the, the basic objective of the e-privacy regulation. Um, we also prioritise the protection of children and the and 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 um, countering and preventing child sexual abuse online, and that's why um, just le less than a month ago, the Commission proposed a regulation, an interim regulation, which will ensure that providers of online communication services, such as webmail or messaging services, they they can continue their current voluntary practices of detecting and reporting child sex abuse material um, and removing it um, after 20, uh, tw December 2020 when the Electronic Communications Code um, revision comes into force and so that these companies will have a legal basis for doing what they're doing. And, and further down the line, we've, we've undertaken that by, by the middle of next year, we will have new comprehensive legislation for tackling um, and fighting child sexual abuse which will replace the interim regulation which we proposed last month. So the German, the German presidency are wholly committed to um, making progress on e-privacy. Um, there are a number of specific difficulties which you may be aware of. The use of cookie walls, for example, which make um, access to a particular website conditional on agreeing to be tracked and having your behavior online tracked. Um, we're looking further ahead as well. We're, we, we're, we've just commissioned a study into, into the ad tech ecosystem, its impact on privacy, um, alternatives which are available to tracking online, and also how the, um, how the evolution of the ad tech 
um, ecosystem um, and the growth of intermediaries, and particularly uh, the monopoly platforms of Google and Facebook and others have have um, have have um, impacted um, European publishers and advertisers and the share that they get of advertising revenue. So there's a lot more going on. We could talk for a long time, but um, that's all um, on cybersecurity and e-privacy. And if there are any questions, um, I'd be very happy to take them. Um, but thank you. Thank you for your attention.